Hello, welcome back to the Goddess Foundation podcast. Um, this is the founder of the Goddess Foundation, um, as usual, Courtney Cluftis. And um, I'm starting today, uh, as you can see, talking about vagina problems for all women and femme-bodied individuals out there who experience any sort of pain or trauma um, in their vulval vaginal region. Um, and I talked about this in the inaugural episode, the pilot episode of the podcast, how I hope to um, create a section of the Goddess Foundation that is dedicated to a sort of support group for anyone suffering from these and similar issues, um, similar to those that I personally suffer from, um, from which I personally suffer dangling prepositions. Um, anyway, before I launch into that, I just wanted to open with some exciting news. Um, I, my, my wife, Carmen, just accepted a position as the director of an intro, intercultural student center at a community college in southern Maine, coincidentally enough, where I grew up uh, in the suburb of Portland and Portland, Maine, not the other Portland. Um, and Portland, Maine is actually quite vibrant in its own right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this has all happened rather suddenly. Um, my wife ex formally accepted the position last week and we are moving right around Labor Day, uh, which is crazy and hectic and frantic. I'm trying to, we're trying to find a place to live, which is proving difficult. Um, so anyway, any well wishes <laughs> or positive vibes are much appreciated. We have some leads, but it's definitely kind of a turbulent, chaotic moment in our lives. Very exciting and full of potential, but a little nerve wracking because we're like, will we have a roof over our heads? And I'm sure we will. Um, but yeah, anyway, so moving on. Oh, my point being uh, with that news that I might have to take a short hiatus from the Goddess Foundation programming uh, until we get settled. So this will likely be my last episode for a while. Um, and unfortunately, I need to reschedule an episode I was planning on doing uh, an upcoming interview with my friend, um, uh, Kat Rose, uh, a, I believe she's actually Irish, but I think she lives in London, astrologer. Uh, who recently published a book about the daimon in astrology. Um, and I hope to have her on to talk about the daimon, uh, the inner sort of divine, um, and how that manifests through an astrological lens. Um, and she, I had a reading with her. Um, I read over her book manuscript in the early stages. I, it was really a privilege to be able to read it and provide feedback. Um, maybe in another life I was a book editor. Anyway, so I need to reach out to her and reschedule, but that is another upcoming episode um, along the more eudaimonia track of things, which will be absorbed by the Goddess Foundation podcast. Anyway, on to the main topic of today, vagina problems. So <laughs> every time my wife and I go on vacation, um, the two of us are quite literary. Um, we're very bibliophilic, if that's a word bibliophiliac, I'm not sure. Anyway, so whenever we go on vacation, we inevitably end up going to like as many indie bookstores as we can find. <laughs> and we have a favorite in Duluth, um, Duluth, Minnesota, called Zenith Bookstore. Um, just a shout out to Zenith. It's a fantastic place. If you happen to be in Duluth, you, it's a must see. Uh, anyway, so we were there one of the, I think it was a couple summers ago. Um, as per usual, I had collected a stack of like six to seven books and I needed to narrow it down to determine which ones I was actually leaving with uh, more dangling prepositions. And um, while Carmen was still browsing, I stumbled across this title, Endometriosis, Painful Sex and Other Taboo Topics, Vagina Problems by Lara or Laura, I'm not sure, Lara probably, Parker. Um, so I saw this, this image and I was like, I, so I don't have endometriosis. I wasn't even really sure what it was. I knew it was something to do with like painful, ex un extremely painful um, menstrual periods. Uh, anyway, so I was like, well, I have suffered from painful sex and just general pelvic floor vaginal pain. Uh, and I was like, there's a, actually a book about it. And it's so prominently on display. I just, I had to buy it. Um, I will warn you, the book needs some editing. It is 
quite repetitive, like extremely repetitive. That said, um, I really appreciated Lara's raw vulnerability in writing about this um, in a really accessible way um, and really shattering those stigmas and taboos. Um, whoever designed the cover, it's fantastic as well. Um, so she is the deputy director of BuzzFeed, uh, so a fairly prominent figure. Uh, and this is her sort of memoir about living with chronic pain, specifically centering around her pelvic floor, which is um, the region, a series of interconnected muscles um, and musculature that are related to the vagina and the vulva. Um, and men or biological male individuals can also suffer from pelvic pain. I, I recently learned that. Um, I mean, I'm sure it manifests differently, but it's just a very sensitive region of the body um, and is prone to pain, uh, usually undiagnosed pain. Um, so um, I highly recommend this book, again, with the caveat that it could use some editing. Um, but aside from that, it's well worth a read if you've never heard with, had never heard of any of these conditions, um, or if you suffer from them and feel alone as I have for much of my life, um, especially since I was diagnosed. Um, so here we go, less than a year before she, um, she opened up, here we go, let's see, in April, 2014, Laura Parker opened up to the world an article on Buzzfeed talking about suffering from endometriosis. Um, beyond that, she let the whole world know that she wasn't having any sex, penetrative sex, that is, as sex was excruciatingly painful. Less than a year before, she received not only the diagnosis of endometriosis, but also a diagnosis of pelvic floor dysfunction, vulvodynia, vaginismus, and vulvar vestibulitis. I actually am not sure what that um, final one is. I'll have to look it up later. But combined, these debilitating conditions have wreaked havoc on her life, causing excruciating pain throughout her body since she was 14 years old. These are her vagina problems. And she, uh, I guess for several years, doctors insisted she just had bad period cramps and implied that her pain was psychological. She was shamed and stigmatized and the medical community was biased against women um, and essentially was telling her that the pain was all in her head. And the, um, this um, really affects me on a deep level because the first time I had a, um, a pap smear or an attempted pap smear when I was about 22, 23, um, the doctor told me that the pain was all in my head and to stop being a baby. Uh, and since I've talked to my therapist and my sex therapist about this, um, they've both been horrif horrified and appalled. Uh, my current gynecologist is also horrified and appalled that a medical professional, also a woman, was so incredibly dismissive of my pain and the trauma that that induced. Anyway, so I highly recommend this book. Um, let's get down to business. What is, let's start with vaginismus. What is it? All right, there's a website here, vaginismusawareness.com, and um, they have a brief definition of it. Vaginismus is the term used to describe recurrent or persistent involuntary tightening of the muscles around the vagina whenever penetration is attempted. And this is any form of penetration. This can be a finger, a tampon, doesn't have to be a phallus or a phallic shaped object like a penis or a dildo or a vibrator or whatever. Um, and I personally can attest to this. Um, It can, here we go, it's a complex psychosomatic condition. Causes can be varied, such as painful first intercourse, sexual abuse, in my case, an extremely painful and traumatic um, attempted <laughs> pap smear um, or gynecological procedure, fear of pregnancy or deeply rooted belief that sex is wrong. Um, so it's, it's common among women who are sort of afflicted with the patriarchal Christianizing doctrine that sex before marriage is dirty and that's women, sex is painful for women, um, which is a recurring myth. Um, and it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy with vaginismus because you're so afraid of the pain, the body muscles tighten up and 
self-fulfilling prophecy. You experience pain. Uh, it's not, I'm oversimplifying it vastly, um, but it's really important that people be aware of this condition because it affects so many women and um, female bodied or biologically female individuals from across the globe. It is not in any way, Kate, in any way, shape or form a rare condition, which is what I thought. And neither is it in your head. It may have some psychological components, um, but my opinion, mind, body, spirit connection, every sort of illness or disease um, has a psychological component. Um, you cannot extricate the body from the mind and the consciousness uh, that resides within. Um, and that is a foolish, foolhardy uh, tactic. So this is a helpful website. Um, what to do if you have vaginismus. And here's some diagnosis some statistics, approximately one in 10 women have experienced painful intercourse in the last six months. And again, they're, it's a little problematic. They're referring to intercourse, assuming it's penetrative sex. Um, two out of every 1000 women have at least moderate vaginismus. Um, let's see. So it's, it's actually quite common. Um, so I also wanted to shout out um, the show Sex Education on Netflix, the Netflix original series. One of my all-time favorite characters in the show, the quirky, alien-obsessed, um, queer character Lily suffers from vaginismus. And I remember watching the show and it's just so sex positive and body positive and queer positive. Um, such a wide variety of um, sexual orientations and gender expressions on the show. So it's unusual in that respect. And also really, I, it's a must watch. Anyway, um, in one of the episodes, um, Lily is on a bike going down a hill and she's complaining with complaining um, about her inability to have penetrative sex. Um, and she's so, and it, it, it dismisses, the show shatters the illusion or the myth that um, women who suffer from vaginal pain, like vaginismus, are asexual. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that identity. It is a very legitimate identity. Um, but suffering from vaginal pain does not mean that you dislike sex or cannot be aroused or do not feel sexual and erotic pleasure. Um, that is a misnomer. Um, Lily is incredibly sex positive. She writes erotica, um, really like unconventional erotica featuring like alien beings, um, very queer positive as well and sex positive, but she has vaginismus. Um, and this article, uh, refinery29.com, what sex ed gets right about vaginismus is great. Look at her, she's adorable and amazing. Uh, she's having sex with her girlfriend and uh, all is, here, I'm just gonna read this excerpt. All is going well until Ola, her girlfriend, slides a hand under Lily's silver miniskirt. Mini Ow, Lily yelps and explains to Ola, it's not you, it's me. I have something called vaginismus. My vagina is like a Venus flytrap. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Um, it's kind of what it feels like from someone who suffers from vaginismus and has for a very, very long time. Um, Lily gives Ola a quick explanation of her condition, showing her a kit of five different size dilators that she's supposed to insert into her vagina, though so far she can only use the smallest one. Um, and yeah, the article goes on. It's super helpful. Um, I highly recommend reading it or watching the show if you're curious to learn more about what vaginismus is and how you can overcome it. Um, I haven't fully overcome it myself or overcame it, but I'm working toward it. Um, and using dilators um, in conjunction with a medical professional and or a sex therapist is one way to work towards it. Pelvic floor physical therapy, uh, which I've tried and ultimately proved to be only moderately helpful, minimally helpful in my case, um, but I'm open to revisiting at a future date. Anyway, good article, really great article. Finally, promoting Vaginismus Awareness Day, September 15th. Um, this is from the Contemporary Institute of Clinical Sexology. This article um, published on my late mom's birthday, no less, September 13th. Um, this woman writes about vaginismus. 
Um, so it's here she writes about some of the causes. And this woman is Julia, no, excuse me, Julie Sale. Vaginismus is caused by a wide range of biological, psychological, and social factors. So on the biology side, if a person with a vagina has vulvodynia, vulval, I think that's supposed to say vulval, it's a typo, eczema or psoriasis, repeated bouts of BV, I'm not sure what that is, or thrush, overactive bladder or chronic un urinary tract infections, UTIs, or any other condition affecting the reproductive system, they're likely to experience pain during sexual activity, which could quite understandably trigger vaginismus. It's the pelvic floor's way of saying no thank you to pain. So essentially it's your vi vagina or your vulva trying to protect you. It's a defense mechanism. It tightens up and says, no thank you, like, nope, I refuse to be subjected to more pain. Um, it's a sort of like bracing yourself. So picture this, like, it's kind of like the vagina goes in fight or flight mode and clenches up like a, an angry fist or a scared and angry fist. Um, so it can be caused by psychological anxieties around sex or painful sex. Um, it can be biological or like due to chronic UTIs, that sort of thing, like this woman just said. Um, it can also be triggered by sexual abuse and sexual assault that by no means reduces it to that. It's not in intrinsically linked to sexual assault. There's many women and individuals who've suffered sexual assault who don't have vaginismus and many people like myself who have fortunately never experienced sexual assault who do have it. Um, anyway, so that's the bit I rant on vaginismus. Um, let me scroll down. Do, do, do. I'm having issues getting the screen to, ah, here we go. I think this is, yes. What is vulvodynia or vestibulodynia? This is another condition I have. It's a pain disorder of the vulva uh, and vestibulodynia is specifically just like the very entrance of the vulva. Uh, vulvodynia, it's, it's, it's like more localized. Vulvodynia is like the entire vulva or any part of the vulva. Vestibulodynia is just that like teeny little, little entrance bit. My anatomy lessons. Yeah, this is embarrassingly bad, but so basically it causes severe pain, burning and stinging of the vulva. It's very similar to vaginismus and the two conditions tend to be linked, but um, that vaginismus is muscular in nature. It's the muscles being overreactive um, and just too tight. <laughs> Your vagina is too tight. Um, one of my good friends, <laughs> she has a great sense of humor. When I told her about my vagina problems, um, <laughs> And I said, basically my vagina is too tight. She said, there you go. You have your Tinder profile right there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's good to be able to laugh about it uh, and to have really great friends like that. Shout out to my awesome friend Libby for being so great. Um, anyway, so vaginismus is the muscular tightening, vulvodynia, which is often interrelated or in, uh, interconnected with it is more of a nerve ending thing, like hypersensitive nerve endings. Um, and the two are hard to tease apart. There are different, um, my gynecologist I'm sure could speak to the differences and how you diagnose one versus the other. Um, but yes, this is um, vulvodynia, sharp, burning, itching, throbbing pain. I will talk about this later when I tell you my own story with vaginismus and vestibulodynia, more localized form of this nerve, nerve ending vagina problem. <laughs> to invoke Lara Parker, vagina problems. It's a good way of putting it. I just, just have vagina problems and the world needs to know because we need to talk about these and get rid of that stigma and taboo. So this is a great resource from Mount Sinai. Uh, here is a, the National Vulvodynia Association, support contacts and support group meetings. I will link to all of these resources eventually on the Goddess Foundation website on the section devoted to suffering from chronic pain. Um, all right, um, here's some articles. Oh, actually I will get back to the articles later because uh, this is linked to my own story. Um, so let's see, where do I begin? All right, um, so growing up, I was always kind of a late bloomer. 
Um, it was sort of a running joke with friends. I mean, part of the late bloomer was I didn't have my first period until I was 17, um, even later than my mom who had her first period when she was 16. Um, so I suffered from the shame of being underdeveloped throughout most of my teenage years, um, basically not having breasts, feeling like a child or a woman in a child's body for a very long time. And that um, certainly affected my sex life. I basically didn't have one. I wasn't brought up in a sex shaming um, ultra religious household where it was like masturbation is a big no, no. <laughs> I just didn't feel comfortable in my body. Um, and I didn't really identify with my body as my own. It never felt like a safe place. And this, um, it wasn't just a sexual thing. Uh, this manifested in many different ways. And I am convinced is related to my childhood um, sensory integration disorder um, and um, developmental delays. Um, so sensory integration disorder is often linked with autism, but not all people with sensory integration disorder are autistic or somewhere on the spectrum, um, myself as a <laughs> prime example. But essentially sensory integration disorder is when certain sensory stimuli are so overpowering, you basically cannot absorb them and integrate them in a healthy way. Um, and uh, I used to essentially, for me, it was primarily auditory, um, although I think some of it was probably tactile. Um, or touch oriented, but um, I remember my mom who actually found her career as an occupational therapist um, through coming to terms with my childhood developmental delays and this sensory integration disorder um, that helped her find her, her vocation. So um, I'm grateful, I guess, in some way, shape or form, my conditions, my disorders were able to serve some greater purpose in that, in that way. But sorry, I'm rambling. Um, Sensory integration disorder, sensory stimuli are basically too much and you just kind of dissociate from your body or find some other way of shutting down um, in order as an avoidant protective tactic. And I am convinced that my vaginismus and or my vestibulodynia, the nerve ending um, oversensitivity um, are related to this. And this hasn't been adequately studied, um, but there is an article I found, let's see, here we go. Um, so I'll include this link in the show notes. It's an article um, in BMC Research Notes. I believe this is a um, peer-reviewed um, journal, um, Journal of Rare Diseases. Um, it's not actually that rare, like I just said, but this article also published coincidentally enough on my mom's birthday, weird synchronicity, uh, is entitled Sensory Processing of Women Diagnosed with Genitopelvic Pain Slash Penetration Disorder. Um, so it's a preliminary pilot study of trying to ascertain whether or not women um, with some sort of sensory processing disorder, such as myself, are more prone to pelvic pain or vaginal pain. Um, I mean, this is entirely anecdotal, but from my perspective, from my lived experience, I would say yes. I cannot speak to every woman or biological female on this planet who has sensory processing disorder, um, whether or not they suffer from pelvic pain, but I personally do. Um, it's an interesting article. Um, and there was also this fantastic talk on YouTube um, by a sex therapist and psychologist, Samantha Manowitz, um, who <laughs> gave this great, really short, just, just over a half hour talk on YouTube called, I love you, don't touch me sex and sensory processing disorder. Again, just what I was talking about. Anyway, back to my personal story. So I was always prone to being overwhelmed by any sort of sensory stimulation, um, whether it was auditory or tactile. Um, I just tended to shut down and dissociate from my body. And I found that my body was not a safe place, not through any form of sexual assault or violation of my body, just being a human in a body in the physical world was just always way too much for me. And I'm working through that in my sex therapy. Um, so I would recommend sex therapy. It's expensive and I'm battling with um, my insurance company trying to get them to reimburse because um, it should be covered for people with my condition. But as we all know, the healthcare system in the US is colossally fucked up. Pardon my French. Anyway, so, 
recommend it if you can afford it. I'm privileged enough that right now I can, um, even without the medical coverage kicking in right away. So childhood sensory processing disorder, probably linked to my later discovery that I, my body says no to penetration in any way, shape or form. Uh, the first time I experienced this was the first time I tried to insert a tampon. I was about 17. Like, like I said, I was, I first menstruated on the late end of the spectrum uh, within the normal range, but on the very late end of it. Um, and I was at a friend's house at a sleepover and I was started bleeding. And I think she had like a pool or a hot tub and I wanted to go in, but I couldn't go in because I didn't want to bleed everywhere. So um, either she or her mom gave me a tampon and it wasn't even like one of those jumbo ones. It was just like a normal size or even a slim one. And I remember going into the bathroom and I, was, I had to have been in the bathroom for like 30 minutes. It, I mean, maybe it was only 10 minutes, but it stretched on for what felt like an eternity for me. And I remember I could not insert the tampon to save my life. <laughs> there was a point at which I think I was so tense and I was triggering my vaginismus to the point that like it, my vagina was so closed up that I couldn't even find, I could not even find the hole. And I was convinced I was, I was like, I don't have a vagina. The doctor never told me or my parents, um, but I am like an anomaly. Um, I don't have any sort of genital organ, whether it be quote unquote male or female. And I, I just sort of started catastrophizing and spiraling, which obviously made it worse and borderline impossible. So at some point I just gave up and I wasn't able to go in the hot tub. Again, first world problem admittedly, but it was a traumatic experience. Um, what else was I gonna say? Flash forward to uh, a couple of years later, I finally managed to get a tampon in. Uh, and I remember I wasn't bleeding very heavily on that day. And I did go, it was like at a party and I went in the pool. It was a similar reason. I was like, I need to get a tampon in so I can go swimming. So I managed to get it in after a lot of hyperventilation and anxiety. Um, <laughs> the problem came when I tried to remove the tampon. And it was like this excruciating burning pain. And I remember screaming and crying. And I was like, I basically resolved to never use a tampon again. I was like, this is just too much. I can't, I was like, I cannot tolerate this pain. It's not worth it just so I can go swimming while I'm on my period. Um, <laughs> years later, I think I was probably 19 or 20. So this is a little humiliating. Um, I was on vacation with my family and I wanted to go to the pool. Recurring theme. I'm bleeding out of my vagina and I want to go swimming. God damn it. I have to use a motherfucking tampon. And again, pardon all my French. This, this podcast is a safe space for cursing. The goddess swears. There's a lot of fucked up shit in this world that's worth cursing about. <laughs> so I, this is not sanitized in any way, shape or form. <laughs> or censored. Yeah. So I remember it was the same story. I managed to get the tampon in and I left it in for way too long. I mean, not to the point where I was in danger of like developing some sort of infection and dying from it, thankfully, but it was reaching the point where it was like, okay, my mom was like, Courtney, you need to take that tampon out. And I was like, I can't do it. And I remember again, I was in the bathroom where we were staying our vacation rental, hyperventilating and crying. Um, and just being kind of a general mess until my mom eventually came in and she was like, Courtney, come with me to the, the bed. And I lay down and my mom removed the tampon for me and it hurt, but somehow having her do it, um, even though I was embarrassed because I was like 20 years old and my mom was taking a tampon out of my vagina. Um, it was like, mom, you do that for me. Um, sorry. Triggering a lot. Speaking of being raw and vulnerable in such a public setting. Anyway, so it was kind of a it's kind of a an inside joke between the two of us until she died. It was like, yeah, my 20-year-old daughter, I took out her tampon because otherwise I was gonna like have a panic attack or something. Um yeah. So years later, I was still seeing a pediatrician 
at 22 and I was just mortified and I was like okay no I have not had sex um there's something wrong with my vagina I knew that much from the tampon traumas but I felt pressure to go see a gynecologist I was like you know I'm an adult woman I haven't had sex yet and at that time I didn't realize I hadn't realized yet I was queer so in my mind I was like trying to make myself interested in men um not afraid of penises or grossed out by them anyway that's a whole other story but so I finally went I finally steeled up the, my nerves to go see a gynecologist um I did not this, know this doctor from Eve I would say from Adam but I'm going to say from Eve instead um but my dad was going to this medical clinic in Southern Maine uh and he was like here's a gynecologist you can go see and it's like all right I remember I really wanted my mom to come with me but I was like, no, Courtney, you're 22 years old or 23. I, I don't remember exactly. Somewhere in that age range. I was like, you're, you're an adult. You're doing this yourself. And I still remember for some reason I dressed up to go to the doctor. Um, and I was wearing these, like, they weren't even high heels, really. They were maybe like a quarter of an inch um, strappy sandals. I don't know why the hell I dressed up to look sexy going to the gyno. <laughs> but I remember falling down the stairs on my way to the car and I was fine. I mean, I might've bruised my butt slightly, but I should have used, I should have seen that as a, a warning sign, like, don't go, don't go. So I got to the clinic and I remember the doctor was an older woman, um, kind of butch. She may have been queer for all I know. And I remember she was very direct and very kind of austere and aloof. Um, she didn't really establish a very comforting um, environment. Um, it was very sterile as most clinics and hospitals are, but her attitude was also quite sterile and demeanor and did not make me feel even remotely at ease. So I remember getting naked, putting on like the hospital gown thingy, um, and then putting my feet in the stirrups, feeling exposed and vulnerable. And I was like, well, but Courtney, you're an adult, you got to do this. Like, cause adult women have pap smears and vaginal exams. You're going to be fine. So I remember her coming into the room with this um, young male medical student who I believe was French Canadian, so near Maine and Maine, so near, near like Quebec, Montreal, so not unusual. And he walked in and I remember he was very attractive um, and I'm primarily attracted to women, but I can appreciate masculine beauty. So he was attractive and I was like, well, this is awkward because I'm like standing there with my legs spread wide open, my feet in the stirrups like very, very anxious. And now like, oh God, now there's like an attractive person in the room. What do I do? This is weird. And I remember the gynecologist looked at me and she said, um, training my medical student, is it all right if he does the procedure? And because I'm a people pleasing idiot, um, I just said yes, even though in my mind I was screaming, no, 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 there were more red flags. Um, but I said yes, naively. And because I'm too fucking nice. Um, and I remember she handed him the speculum and it was the smallest one, but as most people who've ever had a pap smear can attest to speculum looks like a medieval torture device. So I remember he like spread the mechanism apart and then started to insert it in my vagina. And I immediately like, I remember this burning, burning pain. And it was so bad that I remember I was like pushing myself away from the edge of the, of the table. I was literally moving, trying to move away from it. Um, and I remember um, the doc, the, the medical student was clearly like nonplussed and confused. Like this has never happened before. What am I supposed to do? And the doctor who was supervising the medical student, I remember she like put her hand on my abdomen and um, looked at me very sternly and was like, and I was like, oh my God, it hurts, it hurts. And she said, stop being such a baby. It's in your head, keep going. And she told the, doc the medical student to keep going. And I kept pushing away, trying to get away. So at some point she was like, you're being like, this is not, this is a futile effort. And she gave up and the medical student gave up. I think I started crying and I was like, this is awkward. And then the medical student was like, awkward. What is that word? What does awkward mean? And uh, it was just this very, it made it even more awkward and uncomfortable. 
And I don't remember really anything else from that first gynecological visit slash attempted pap smear other than the assault. Um, and I do consider that a form of sexual assault. Um, no, I was not raped, um, but I very clearly said no. And my body was also very clearly saying no. And the doctor would not listen to me. And she urged the medical student to keep doing the pap smear, keep attempting the procedure without my consent. Um, and uh, it was extremely traumatic. And I am convinced that I had the vulvodynia before, um, which is the burning sensation, the nerve endings being hypersensitized, perhaps linked with my sensory processing disorder. Um, but that that sexual assault at the um, medical clinic provoked secondarily vaginismus, the muscular tightening. Um, so that's my story in a nutshell. Um, and I'm finally healing from it. I have a very supportive wife, um, a very supportive sex therapist, um, <laughs> supportive, a supportive inner pantheon of gods and goddesses who are helping me work through this. And um, learning to accept that there is nothing wrong with my body. There's something wrong with main, our mainstream cultures, views of women's bodies um, and the lack of agency women have over their own bodies, even at medical clinics, especially vulnerable young women like myself. So um, to anyone who's had a similar traumatic experience, my heart goes out to you. I am deeply sorry and you should have never had to have faced that. But this is just my own personal story of a very, very real condition or two conditions really in my case um, that are stigmatized and so taboo and so invisibilized in our society that even gynecologists, some of them, hopefully the vast minority of them are unfamiliar with these conditions or are convinced that they do not exist which is infuriating um, and frightening, <laughs> um, putting trust in medical professionals who basically tell, explicitly tell you to stop being a baby, the pain is in your head. Yes, there might be a psychological component, um, but it is a very, very, very real phenomenon. And I can personally attest to that. So what are some resources for um, people who are going through this or have experienced pelvic pain in some time of their life? Here's one, The Spiritual Feminist. Um, this is a podcast and website. I, can't, I think she's based in the Netherlands and I do not remember her first name, um, but I listened to this podcast episode a while ago. It's entitled, My Vulnerable Story of Vaginismus and the Journey Towards Healing My Root and Sacral Chakra. It's a really powerful story. Another one, um, The Conscious Sexuality Podcast. Um, this woman who, I forgot her name. Um, interestingly enough, she also has Greek heritage. Um, she and her husband live in uh, Australia or New Zealand, um, and she has managed to overcome her vaginismus. Um, she was so infected with Christian purity culture that it provoked vaginismus, um, but she's managed to overcome it, and she actually gave birth naturally to a baby six months ago, which is um, amazing. She's really, this is a powerful story check out her website and her podcast, Conscious Sexuality. I recently discovered this podcast, The V-Hive, all things women's intimate health related. Um, so here's the story. No one should suffer in silence. After seven years of navigating her own pelvic pain, gut issues and hormonal imbalances, the founder, Hannah, came to realize that in order to combat all of these issues, we have to acknowledge them. 2 billion women worldwide, again, this is very cisgendered language, which is problematic in its own right, but for now we'll go with it. 2 billion women worldwide are, or excuse me, will experience a pelvic floor disorder at some point in their lives. So why aren't we talking about it? Well, I am talking about it today, very publicly, very vulnerably sharing my story because I think it's important that people hear it. Um, as uncomfortable and awkward as it may be, as I said during that traumatic pelvic exam. Yes, it was fucking awkward, but more so it was fucking painful. And I felt and was violated by a medical professional in whose hands I was putting my body. 
and my trust, very foolishly, as it turns out. So this is a great resource. Um, and yeah, that's really all I've got for today. Um, I know this was kind of a rant, but I think it was important that I come out publicly as someone who suffers from vaginismus and vestibulodynia and has been working for decades on healing it. And it is finally, finally, because I have a genuine caring support network um, and I'm learning that more and more people suffer from this, realizing that I am not alone uh, has helped immensely in the really long process of healing. Um, so as usual, I'm gonna end with a divine feminine or goddess oracle card reading. Let's see what we've got. Oh, I have a card sticking out. Let's see which this one is. Integrity, card number 31. So apparently this card has some wisdom for us today. Integrity, let's see what, what it has to say. Card number 31, here we go. Lilith, how apt, okay. The first wife, Sumerian goddess, demonized. And I have a whole episode on Lilith, so it's kind of funny that I pulled that card of all cards in the deck. All right, so the story of Lilith is present in Sumerian texts dating from 20, circa 2400 BCE. She's depicted as a part bird, part woman demoness figure. Sounds like the sirens from Greek mythology. Anyway, in Jewish and Christian mythology and in some older versions of the biblical rendition of creation, Lilith was Adam's first wife. She was created at the same time as Adam and from the same earth, not from his root. As an aside, I read somewhere and I can't remember in which book that Adam actually translates back to Adama, which means like red clay, like bloody earth, which I thought was fascinating and makes me think of menstruation cosmic menstruation. Uh, when Adam tried to assert his authority over Lilith, she refused to submit and instead left the Garden of Eden to live an independent life. Um, action, integrity. Lilith sits with firm resolve and purposeful dignity just outside an imposing glass tower. Living by her own rules, Lilith is complete and truly inhabits a seat of power. The card is a reminder to listen to your inner wisdom including your body's wisdom. Um, you really do know the right course of action. Lead with confidence and conviction. Lengthen your spine, stand tall and say out loud, I am the foremost authority of my own life. And this is something I need to remember. Um, I, in the moment of that traumatic pelvic exam with the gynecologist who um, really should have lost her medical um, credentials, she should have been stripped of her power and authority, but I needed to stand up and reclaim my voice and power in that moment and say, no, this is not acceptable. This is my body. I am experiencing pain. It is not up to you to tell me whether or not the pain is real. So I needed to reclaim my authority and my agency, say fuck you to Adam and the heteropatriarchy and walk out into the wilderness and reclaim my sexual power and agency, um, which is part of what the goddess rep the goddess foundation represents and promotes and this is one of the reasons why i personally feel compelled to create a space on the goddess foundation website to provide resources and support for other women and femme bodied individuals like me who have suffered from these invisibilized conditions um, and to stand up and reclaim our voices and reclaim our bodies and to heal together all right. In any case, just a reminder, I will probably not be back for quite a while, maybe a couple months even, but um, stay tuned for more Goddess Foundation um, programming, both on the website, blog, and on this podcast slash YouTube channel. Much love to all of you out there. Mwah.